Good morning. How are we doing? I'm going to present the video for... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, before we start the message today, I just want to thank you for the empanada week. Thank you for buying all those empanadas. Many of you have been asking me about them. And uh, we're, we're like Colombia now, right? We like Colombian empanadas. So thank you very much. Uh, we will sell them again, I promise you. And uh, just start saving, all right? Put some money aside. No, also, I want to talk to the Latino woman in the room, the women that know Spanish in this room. Anybody here know Spanish? Okay, all right. <laughs> I see one man raise his hand, but we're talking to the woman now. Uh, there's going to be a conference in our church right here from the Gospel Coalition, a Spanish woman conference on August 9th and August 10th. So if you're interested in some information in the back and the information desk back there, there's some flyers. My beautiful wife is going to be back there after the service, and I would like you to go and register. It's only $12. It's right here at home. You don't have to go anywhere, and it's going to be fantastic. I really, really recommend it. So if you know Spanish, if you can read and write Spanish, come on over. Have some fun. All right, and learn. Well, good to be here with you today. We continue our series today. Praying through the scriptures or using the scriptures to pray. And uh, I want to encourage you, if you haven't heard the messages, you know, if you're in a point where you don't know how to pray, man, how good it is to look at scripture and pray scripture. And today you're going to see a wonderful example of that. We're going to be in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 2. If you want to go there with your Bibles and just place your finger there, we'll be right there. Man, I love Father's Day. You can see it. I got my dog tags from Father's Day. We gave them out. I got them bilingual, so I have two. But uh, I love Father's Day. I love receiving the cards from my kids and reading all the stuff they say about me. I, I love to hear their praises. Oh, Dad, you're such a wonderful father. You've been such a great example to us. Thank you for being the man of God you are and modeling what you believe. And I feel proud. I'm like, yeah, man, I, I've done a pretty good job with this voice. Uh, being their father. But it's interesting to me that uh, while they were growing up, they didn't praise me too much. You know, I don't understand that. I was trying to put in practice what I believe, and it was like, Dad, really? You have to behave that way? And Dad, why can't you be like oh, somebody else's dad? You know, they allow them to do all this stuff. How come we can't do it if they can't do it, right? And the praises were far and few in between. It was, it was more negative comments than than positive one, but I was not surprised because obviously they were kids back then. Now they mature, they're adults, they're men, and they see the value in that, right? But, you know, I think sometimes we behave like that with God. You know, when things are going good, we say, oh, God, I love you so much. You are my God. Oh, Father, I love you so much, I don't even know how to express it, Lord. We say things like, God is good. And all the time, okay, that was kind of weak. God is good, and all the time, all right, all the time, all the time, really? What about when difficulty strikes? Oh, God, you're so good all the time. What about when you lose your job or get sick? Hmm? What about when things don't go our way? That changes a little bit, doesn't it? Do you praise God in the good as well as in the bad? I'll let you answer that. You don't have to say it out loud. Today we're going to study a prayer. It's really a song of praise. It's a, it's a heartfelt prayer from a mother, a woman that knew what suffering was. She knew what it was to be in a difficult situation, and she chose to praise God regardless. Regardless, you may have heard the story. Her name is Hannah, and her story is described in First Cha Samuel chapter one. And just to make a long story short, you know, she was married to um, Elkanah. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Am I? My teacher says he's pronouncing it correctly. So now Elkanah had two wives. Well, most of the women here will go, "Well, that's a problem." But back in the day, you know, or back in those days. It was okay to have two wives, and that was actually not Hannah's problem. She didn't have a problem with sharing her husband, I guess. Her problem was she couldn't have children. And the other wife, her name was Penina, 
And you'll understand real quick why her name is Penina, because she was a pain in a, you know. <laughs> anyways. Um, anyways, but <laughs> Penina was seemingly popping kids out every year. It's like she was having kids like nobody's business. And not only that, but Penina thinking she was better than Hannah, the Bible says she would provoke her grievously and irritate her. Every time they went up to the temple of the Lord. Now, that's interesting to me. They went up to the temple once a year to bring the sacrifice to the Lord, right? And here's Penina making Anna's life a misery. Now, does that happen to you? Sometimes we're driving to church and somebody's making your life miserable right there on the ride to church. (laughs) We're going to church and we're arguing over here, right? Well, Penina was doing that. But now now here's the tricky part. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever made a vow to the Lord? Like a, like a crazy promise. Have you ever said, God, if you do this, I will do that? And just, just fill in the blank, right? God, really, if you just do this for me, this one time, just do it right now, and I will do that. I will give my life away. I'll go to the mission field if you do this, right? We, we make those promises every now and then, right? About 23 years ago, my 10-year-old son, Gabriel, back then he was 10, today he's 33, He's a big boy. But uh, Gabriel was uh, 10, and he had a strong desire to own this particular bicycle. It wasn't just any bicycle. Okay, I have to read it because I can't even remember. It's a GT Performer BMX. Okay? Do we have the picture? There you go. That's that beauty right there. He was on me for this bicycle day and night persistently selling me on the incredible benefits that of having this bicycle and the incredible pain that he was going through because he didn't have it. You can understand that. He was on me and on me. He insisted so much that I, I made a promise. I made one of those I don't plan to fulfill kind of promise. You know, a promise that I had no intention to keep promise. You know, the bicycle was $300. Now, I'm talking 1996. Okay, I'm not talking 2019. 2019, every bicycle is $300. That was 1996. It was a 10-year-old boy. I just started working with Wells Fargo Bank on full commission, and there were no sales yet. Okay, I couldn't afford a popsicle, much less a bicycle. You understand what I'm saying? But he insisted so much that I broke, and I said, okay. Okay, Gabriel, this is the deal. You bring me $150, and I'll buy you the bicycle. Case closed, right? (laughs) He's 10. I'm done. No need to fulfill this promise. No bicycle. Uh, Not so with my child. Oh, my child. My child went to his mother. Thank you, honey. And borrowed $13. I'm still hurting for this one. But he borrowed $13. He went to Costco and bought a box of M&M's. And, you know, M&M's, 24 in a box. He went selling them out on the street for a dollar a piece. Came back, bought more M&M's, and went out and sold them. And I wish the Baileys were here. They could give you testimony to this because they went to the Baileys' house. He went to the Baileys' house with a ripped shirt, telling people, I'm selling M&M's because I need to help my dad buy some clothes. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. And needless to say, within a few weeks, my little boy came to me and said, Dad, guess what? Here's $150. (laughs) I should have been selling M&M's with him out in the street, right? But because I stayed home, (laughs) I had to borrow $150 to buy that beautiful bicycle that's still in my garage to this day. And God forbid I try to sell it or get rid of it. It's a price possession. Well, it reminds me what kind of promises I'm going to make, right? Well, the case with Hannah was a little bit different. It was more serious than mine. But if you see in this chapter, Hannah made a vow to the Lord. And not only did she make a vow, a promise to the Lord, she made a vow to the Lord in the temple of the Lord. And she made a vow to the Lord in the temple of the Lord in front of the priest of the Lord, Eli. She made a vow that she was not planning on breaking. And it was a serious vow. Look at their vow in 1 Samuel 1, 11. 
She says, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. Wow. Now she was basically saying, God, if you give me a boy, I'll give him back to you. If you take this shame away from me of not being able to have kids, God, I will give this child back to you. Now, I don't know about you, but that is a pretty intense promise. I don't know if I could do something like that. I can't even imagine the desperation of a mother to be willing to do that. Now, the story continues, and Hannah had a boy. His name was Samuel. We know him as the prophet Samuel. And... Uh, and she nursed the kid. She breastfed the kid for three or four years. Now, if you're a mother, you probably understand this a lot better than I do. But I can only imagine the closeness of a baby with his mother for three or four years. I mean, I have my granddaughter in May for two weeks. And they had to pry her out of my arms to take her out, right? And when she looked at me and said, Papa, where are you? I started crying. I'm like, why are you taking her from me? Just leave her here. So I can't imagine a mother nursing her baby close to her heart for three or four years. And then the time came to fulfill the promise. I don't know. I have to think that during that time, her mind was playing games with her. I mean, it would have done it with me. Well, you know, God knew that I was kind of desperate. And maybe I don't have to fulfill the promise. You know what? I'll take good care of him, God. You know, and he will serve you, but he's going to serve you from here. Instead of from there. You know, you know, hey, if I confess my sin, God is faithful and just to forgive, right? Isn't that what we say? And we use those things to not fulfill our promises to God. But not Hannah. Not Hannah. When we pick up the story here in chapter 2, she is not in a place of regret. She is not in a place of guilt. We find Hannah in a place of worship. We, we find her in a place of prayer. We find her in a place of praise. We find her in the presence of her father. That's where we find her. Some scholars think that the prayer of 1 Samuel 2 was taken from psalms and prayers and writings around the temple. And, and to me, that's cool. It makes no difference. What Hannah did is she took the writings, and she made them her own at that particular time. And that's exactly what we've been talking about in this series, right? Taking the Bible, taking the Word of God and making it your own for your particular situation and praying through that Scripture. That is exactly what we've been talking about. So let's take a moment and let's read her prayer. And let's look at a few things that I would like us to learn from this. Verse 1 says, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge. And by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail, 
The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Let's pray. Lord Father, as we look at your word today, Father, would you help us to understand how we can praise you, how we can worship your holy name, even, even in the midst of tragedy, even in the midst of difficulty. Help us to understand how to have a thankful heart and a heart of thanksgiving. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to see four things that we look at in this passage that were obviously in Hannah's mind as she was making this prayer. The first one is the providence of God. The providence of God. I, I believe that the way she started her prayer leads us to believe that she believed in the providence of God. Look at how she started. My heart exalts in the Lord. I mean, this is at a time where she, she knows she's going to have to give up her child. My heart rejoices in the Lord. I mean, she is thankful. You would have expected her to be like regretful, right? I would have expected her to be questioning her vow, but no, she is thankful. She is at peace. She is experiencing total well-being. Now, I believe that this can only be achieved if you understand the providence of God. Providence of God simply means the the guidance, the divine guidance and the divine care that God has for us. And man, this morning, God cares for you. I'm going to tell you. God cares for you. He loves you. He, he wants to care for you. He wants to guide your life. That's why Hebrews 13, 6 says, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. I don't have anything to fear. What can anybody do to me? I have the Lord on my side. Why? Because we believe in the providence of God. Hannah found her strength in the Lord. She said, my horn, which means my strength, is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies. Before, she was afraid of Penina. Now she's saying, my mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. you get this? She has learned to view her life in relationship to the providence of God. That is a powerful thought. And it is only when we get to that point, my brothers and my sisters, it's only when we get to that point that we can rejoice in the midst of difficulty. We can be thankful in the midst of bad circumstances. Only when we understand that God is there to care for us, down deep inside, and that he's guiding us. If you don't get to that point with God, in your life, there's always going to be discontent. There's always going to be restlessness unless you, you really believe in the providence of our God. And Hannah could believe in the providence of God, I believe, because she understood the character of God. She could believe in the providence of God because she understood his character. We can see that in verse 2. In verse 2 she says, there is none holy like the Lord. God is holy. You remember when Isaiah 6, 1? When, when the prophet Isaiah is in the presence of the Lord, he has this vision. And he said, oh my goodness, I'm a man of unclean lips. And this was the prophet of God. He was probably the best man in all of Israel at that time. But he's in the presence of someone that is so holy that he feels dirty. And it says there that God is holy, holy, holy. Perfectly holy. Then she says, there's none beside you. She understood that there is only one God. Hear ye of Israel, the Lord your God is one. There's only one God, and this God is holy. Then we see in verse 2 again, it says, there, there is no rock like you. God is solid. She's saying God is firm. He is reliable. He is almighty. And she goes in verse 3 to say, the Lord is a God of knowledge. He is all-knowing. 
Did you get that? God, there's only one God. He is holy. He is our protector. He is our provider. He is our firm foundation and the solid rock in which I stand. He is holy. He is only one. And he knows everything. Listen, this is our God. This is our God. If you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior this morning, this is your God. He is the God that created the entire universe. And he loves you personally. He wants to have a relationship with you. This is our God. And if this is your God, then why worry? Stop worrying. If this is your God, why doubt? If this is your God, we can say like the psalmist, why so downcast, O my soul? If this is your God, then rejoice in the Lord. And again I say, rejoice. This is our God. Are you having difficulty praying this morning? If you are, take some time and rehearse the characters, the attributes of God. Go through that list. Say, wow, God is all-knowing. He's powerful. He's a rock. He is solid. God doesn't change his mind. He's there for me. He loves me so much he wants to have a relationship with me. Use that to pray if you don't know how to pray. Remind yourself of his greatness. Remind yourself that everything is under his control. He's a sovereign God. And listen, he sent his son to die for you because he wants to have a relationship for you, with you. He intercedes for you. God loves you. You see, Hannah put her trust in God because she understood the providence of God. And she understood the providence of God and she can, she can trust in the providence of God because she understood the character of God. And she knew that God will fulfill what he said because she understood the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign. And what that means is nobody no one in the entire universe, in the seen world, the unseen world, no one can tell God what to do. No one. No one can stop God from doing what he wants to do. God can do what he wants, when he wants, with whoever he wants, whenever he wants. He is sovereign. Look at verses 6 through 8. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make him sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. This is a tough part of the passage. Most people don't want to hear this. Actually, most preachers don't want to even talk about it. You know, we like to talk about the good things, right? God is good all the time. Oh, yeah, he's good. He blessings. I want to receive his blessings. And when we think of our blessings, it's only good stuff, good stuff, good stuff. But here we hear things like the Lord kills. The Lord brings down to Sheol. The Lord makes poor. He brings low. See, honestly, my brothers, if God is sovereign, then he must have a part in everything that happens. Everything that happens in your life and everything that happens in the whole universe. He must. Because you see, if something happens in this entire universe where God didn't have a part of it, then he stops being sovereign. If somebody can do something that God didn't agree with or didn't allow, not agree, but allowed, then he stops being sovereign. You remember the story of Job? Job lost 10 sons and daughters, was a financial crisis all in one day. It was like, boom, everything is gone. You would have expected Job to be devastated, and maybe he was emotionally devastated. 
But look at what he says. Look at his perspective in Job 1.21. It says, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What is he saying? He's saying God is in this. God is sovereign. So blessed be his name. Can you say that today in your difficulty? God is in this. He's got my back. So blessed be the name of the Lord. See, the sovereignty of God has to exist in life, but it has to exist in death. It has to exist in the good and in the bad. You can't pick and choose. This is not Publix. It's either there or it's not. Where shopping is a pleasure. Hannah understood this. And Hannah submitted herself to it. Not so much Mrs. Job. You remember what Mrs. Job told him? She said, curse God and die, man. Curse God and die. Just get it over with. And I love his response. On Job 2.10, he says, shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? Is it all just good that we want to take? See, are you in a dark place today? Is life difficult right now? I know many of us are having difficulties, tough circumstances, and like they say, either you just came out of one, you're about to go into one, or you're in the one. Trust in the providence of God. Trust in the character of God. Trust in the sovereignty. Perhaps it was the difficulties that took Hannah to God's feet. Maybe if it wasn't for Penina, being a Penina, perhaps she wouldn't have surrendered herself and her son to the Lord. You know, many of us, and it happens, we see it all the time. Men and women come for counseling when things are bad. And as soon as things get well, they disappear. We don't see them anymore. You know, as soon as the guys start giving me excuses, well, pastor, you know, I can't go today because this, that, the other. Then the following week, well, pastor, I know things got better. Things got better and they don't need it anymore. So God uses difficult times. Sometimes he uses the darkness, the darkest times in our lives to take us to his feet, to bring us close to him. And those many times work better than the good and the easy times. The last thing I want us to see here is the purposes of God. The purpose of God. Listen, God doesn't do anything without a purpose. God doesn't do anything without a purpose. There is a purpose for everything. Everything that he allows in your life and in mine has a purpose, has a plan. And of course, his ultimate plan is to restore the entire creation. But Hannah understood this reality. She understood that there's a purpose and there is a plan in the midst of everything. Look what she says in verse 9. She says, he will guard the feet of his faithful one, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the end of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. I don't know that she knows she was prophesying over there. But check this out. She starts the the prayer saying, I rejoice in your salvation And she ends the prayer talking about a king. And this was before there were any kings in Jerusalem. Because Samuel was just born. And not only that, she talks about the anointed one. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how much Hannah understood of what she was saying in this prayer. But it's clear to me that she saw the events of her in her life as part of a bigger plan in God's hands. It is obvious. 
And perhaps you think this morning that you have no meaning to God. Maybe you think that God is upset at you and he's got you in time out in a corner for bad behavior or something like that. Listen, my brother, my sister, God has a plan for you. He created you with a plan. And you're part of the bigger plan of God. Everything that happens in your life has a purpose. If you don't think so, you're wrong. You're completely wrong. Listen, God sent his son Jesus to die for you. That's how much he loves you. He sends him to die for you. Not because you deserve it, not because you earn it, because he loves you. He loves you, and he's got a plan for you. Look at it in Ephesians 2, 8 and 10. 8 through 10, it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It says, and this is not of your own doing. You didn't deserve it. You don't earn it. It's a gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. But listen who you are to him. For we, I'm going to say for you, are God's workmanship. I love that word workmanship. It comes from where we get the word poem. And I like to think of myself as a poem being written by God. You are God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, for a purpose which God prepared beforehand. In advance, he prepared for you to walk in it. See what I'm saying? God created you with a purpose. That purpose was there way before you were there. He prepared it in advance beforehand. God loves you. He has a plan for you. He created you with a plan in mind. And what he's allowing in your life, he's allowing it to bring you to the place where you can grow in him, where you can submit to him so he can bring that purpose to flourish in your life. We have to submit to his providence, to his character, to his sovereignty, and to his purpose in our lives. But most importantly, God is in the, in the, God is in the process of building his own church. He's building his body. And the Bible says not even the gates of hell can stop him from doing what he wants to do. And we are part of that body. That's why... Everything that is happening in your life is part of that grand plan of God and purpose. See, you don't need to make a vow to God. You don't need to make a promise that you don't intend to fulfill. What you need to do is be at the feet of God. Hannah understood this. And in 1 Samuel 1.15, it says that she had been pouring out my soul before the Lord. She had been pouring out her soul before the Lord. That's the key. We need to start by pouring out our souls before the Lord. It starts with salvation. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, man, that's the first step. You have to accept Jesus. You got to repent and you got to pour out your soul to God. That's where you start. God will accept you just as you are. You don't have to change. You don't have to clean up. You don't have to dress up. He loves you just the way you are because he made you exactly as you are. And if you accept them, if you pour your soul before the Lord, if you submit to his providence in your life because of his character and his sovereignty, the purpose in your life will be fulfilled. God loves you. God made you with a purpose. And whatever is happening in your life this morning, right now, good or bad, life or death, God has a hand on it. And he's there to guide you and direct you with all his heart. Get before the Lord in prayer. If you don't know how to pray, listen, grab Hannah's prayer. Such a good prayer that even Mary quoted it in Luke 1. 
Grab her prayer. Make it yours. And pray it to the Lord. You'll notice that Hannah didn't ask for one thing of herself in that prayer. All she did was praise the Lord, even though she was going through a difficult time. You can do that too today. And if you don't know the Lord as your Lord and Savior, man, talk to us today. Don't go home lost. God loves you. He created you with a purpose, and he wants to fulfill that purpose in your life. Would you stand with me? Lord God, Father, this morning, I am so glad that you are my God, that you are one, that there's none like you, that you are holy. Father, that you are a solid rock. You don't change your mind, Lord. You are solid. You are there for us today, tomorrow, and you will always be. You said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So, Father, because of who you are, because of your love and care for us, today, Lord, today we can rejoice in you. We can be thankful in you, just like Hannah was. Father, help those of us who are going through difficult times this morning. Help us to surrender ourselves to you. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.